Thank you for joining with us this evening. Let's begin with a song, Revive Us Again. Revive Us Again. tonight this way we ask your blessings upon the service we pray in Jesus name amen and let's continue with another song let's sing there shall be showers of blessing Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, and then once again, Sunday evening, 7 o'clock, and then, of course, Wednesday, as we're uh, uh, live streaming at this time, 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, also, uh, members, if you would and others, please uh, catch up with all the recorded sermons uh, 
uh, you've not viewed yet, please do that. And then also, I do want to mention that uh, I do view the comments that are made. And I really appreciate those who uh, send uh, comments and those who uh, even acknowledge that they're watching. That's a, a real encouragement to me personally. Thank you for uh, doing that. If you're a church member, or if you feel part of this local church ministry, you can send your uh, tithes and offerings and missions giving to First Baptist Church, 235 High Street, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, 08861, Attention Financial Secretary. Before the preaching of God's Word, we're going to sing another song, then we'll look into God's Word this evening. In the service of the King. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, and uh, we'll try to get the verses on the screen also, if you don't have your Bible, but if you do, you may want to follow along. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse number one, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you again that we could be here. Thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would fill me now with thy spirit, and may the word of God go forth in power. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a well-known passage of scripture in the Old Testament, of course, dealing with Israel and the valley of dry bones. And these dry bones will one day in the future be revived and come alive again, and that is the nation of Israel. But the truth is, in our day, many churches are as dead 
as these bones were dead. And you ask why? It's because professing Christians who make up those churches are spiritually dead. Many say they're saved, but they don't live like they're saved. And they're certainly not doing anything for God. I'm saying that there's a form of Christianity today that is very dead in this matter of living for God and serving the Lord. Now, with that in mind, there was only one answer to this dilemma of the bones being dead and being made alive again, given in this passage of Scripture that we're looking at tonight. And so Ezekiel chapter 37, again beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now I want you to notice uh, what God said to Ezekiel in verse number four. And he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones. The answer to bring these bones back was the preaching of God's word. He said, prophesy unto these bones. Prophesy upon these bones. That is, Ezekiel, I want you to preach to these bones. Now, as Ezekiel prophesied to these dead bones in the valley, we find that there were three results that happened because of his preaching to these bones. In this passage, also, there are three different times where the Bible specifically says, prophesy unto the bones. And also, there are three very different individual results because of it. And likewise, just imagine what the hearing of the preaching of God's word would do in our lives if we would hear it and then heed it, and then follow it. And so, I want you to hear now Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, beginning in verse number 7, we have the first time in this passage of Scripture where Ezekiel prophesies to these dead bones. Verse number 7 and then verse 8. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. And so the first result we see as Ezekiel begins to prophesy to these bones is that the bones start coming together. The body started to become unified. Ezekiel prophesied to these bones and unity resulted. And this unification 
takes place in three distinct bodies when the Word of God is preached. And I want to mention those three distinct bodies. Concerning us, those of us who know the Lord as our personal Savior, the first body I want to mention is the body of Christ. The preaching of God's Word brings unification with Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. We find Jesus praying to the Father. Jesus here is thanking the Father for the opportunity he had to minister to his disciples while here on earth. And his desire for his disciples and all other believers is found beginning in John 17, verse 17. The Bible says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now this goes back to the preaching of God's word. Where is truth found? It's found in God's word. How does a believer get sanctification? How does a believer spiritually grow? Through God's word. Therefore, we cannot have sanctification without the preaching of God's word. I want you to hear now John 17, verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Who are they which believe on Jesus? That's those of us who are saved. If you're saved, you got saved by believing on Jesus Christ. What is Jesus' prayer for those of us who are saved? Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What God wants out of the lives of believers is that they be like Jesus. God wants saved people to be exactly like Jesus. He wants saved people to be Christ-like. And that ought to be the desire of say, every saved person, to be like Jesus, to be Christ-like. And Jesus wants saved people to be one with their heavenly Father. And so, here in Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophesying, the preaching of God's word starts bringing unity to these dead bones. And the body that believers are to be united with is the body of Christ. So all believers are to be unified with Christ. Therefore, all believers are to have the mind of Christ. That's the only way we're going to be unified with Christ in that sense. Philippians 2 verse 5 puts it this way, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God's desire for believers is to be part of him. God's desire is for believers to have unity with him. And for that to happen, believers are to have the mind of Christ. And having the mind of Christ comes from hearing God's word. So it's the preaching of God's word that gives that believer the mind of Christ and brings that believer into fellowship with God and his son. And then, concerning us, there's a second body which is found. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Speaking here 
of the unity of, uh, in the local church amongst believers. The point here is that God's word also brings unity to the local church. Not only unity of the saved person with God, but also unity amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking about the preaching of the word of God and what it does. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 6, And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And then go down to verse number 20, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20. But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which is lacked, that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. We have something similar said to us in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and, and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then if we just move down to verse number 11, Ephesians 4, verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I wonder, within the local church, do our words and actions actually edify other brothers and sisters in Christ? It should do, be doing that. There should be no division in the local church, but yet we hear of many local churches where they have church splits and problems uh, in the church, where even members not talking with other members or sitting far away from other, other uh, members. It shouldn't be that way. God wants unity in the local church. And if we're going to have unity in a local church, again, it goes back to having the same mind that is the mind of Christ, especially towards each other. And the preaching of God's word will do that very thing. Again, we're talking about what the preaching of God's word does. Many have used the illustration of a triangle. If God is at the top of the triangle and you're at one point and I'm at the other point, as we draw closer to God, we will draw closer to each other. So if I have the mind of Christ, and if you have the mind of Christ, that means there'll be unity between us. The truth is, we're not trying to disagree with each other, but rather we're trying to agree with God. And if we can agree with God, if I can agree with God, and you can agree with God, there will be unity between us. But again, it's the preaching of God's word that brings that unity to the local assembly. So first, the preaching of God's word brings unity to the saved person, unified personally with God in fellowship. Then 
the preaching of God's word brings unity of the church members within that local assembly, unity with each other. But then thirdly, the preaching of God's word brings unity to a marriage and to the home. In our local church here in Perth Amboy, if you come to any of our services, you will hear that people are not to live like barn barnyard animals. Sex is for married people only, within the bonds of matrimony. And anything outside of that is filthy and vile and disgusting and wicked and sinful and immoral. But many don't know that. And so they don't know any better. They think it's okay and it's normal to live that way. According to the world, it may be, and it is, but not according to God's word. It's the preaching of God's word, though, that has the power to straighten out the mind of any person, to straighten out his thinking, bringing the hand of God's blessing then upon that person and their family. The preaching of God's word will bring unity to a marriage, and it will bring unity to the home. Ephesians 5, verse number 31, the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So two bodies become one flesh. And God's design is for one man to marry one woman and stay that way until death separates them. And that is unification in the body of marriage. And as the husband grows closer to God, and as the wife grows closer to God, again, that triangle uh, illustration, then the husband and wife will grow closer to each other. But let's understand that unity in marriage just doesn't happen automatically. Each has to do his part according to God's word. And that's not going to happen apart from the preaching of God's word. If we don't know what's, what God's word says, how are we going to do what God tells us to do? In Ephesians 5, verse 22, beginning there, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. But then, on the other hand, verse 25 says that the husband is to love his wife. And when he does the way he should, that makes it a lot easier, certainly, for the wife to submit to his leadership and to his headship. And the kind of love spoken here, by the way, is an act of love. That is a love that is seen in action. It's a love seen in doing for the wife. It's no secret that the children with most emotional problems today are those who come from broken homes or parents who have never been married. And that's a fact. And it's because most of these children have no security, have no stability in their lives due to the sinful living conditions of their mother and their father. And that's why they act out the way they do. They're starving for attention. Then also the reason why so many young people go out and live in sin is because they don't hear the preaching of God's word. And that's because their dad and mom couldn't care less about going to church themselves and hearing the word of God preached. But then also, there are so many people involved in their family's uh, uh, life. They need to be in an environment where dad and mom are married and where dad and mom love each other and know that their parents are going to stay together forever. 
That brings security. That brings stability. And that their parents are going to have the mind of Christ and be unified with each other. That brings security. That brings stability. And again, that all comes from the preaching of God's Word. If you don't know by now, what we're talking about is the importance of the preaching of God's Word. And so the preaching of God's Word will bring unity to the body of marriage and to the home. And so the preaching brought unity to those dead bones. And the preaching of God's Word will bring unity to the body of Jesus Christ with the individual believer in God then the preaching of God's word will bring unity in the local body of Christ amongst fellow believers. And then the preaching of God's word will bring unity in the body of the marriage and the home and the family. But not only did the preaching of God's word bring unity, it also brought the Spirit of God Notice with me verse number 9, Ezekiel chapter 37. Here we have the second time Ezekiel is told to prophesy to these dead bones. Ezekiel 37 verse 9, Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And so, as Ezekiel prophesied to these dead bones, the second thing that happened was that the breath of God, the Spirit of God, came into these bones. So the Spirit of God entered into these dead bones, which were coming back together again as a body. And it's the preaching of God's Word that brought the Spirit of God. Every saved person should want the Spirit of God to work in his life. And every member of of a local Bible-believing church should want the Spirit of God to work in their local church. And the only way the Spirit of God can revive an individual, the only way the Spirit of God can revive a church, the only way the Spirit of God can revive a nation is through the preaching of the Word of God. By the way, when it came to the Spirit of God, Ezekiel did not start speaking in some strange language or tongue. He didn't fall to the floor and roll around a while. All he did was to just start preaching God's word. God gives very specific instructions, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 as to prophesying and preaching within the local assembly. I want you to hear now 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation, and comfort. And so the purpose of preaching God's word is to edify the believer. And this modern so-called speaking in tongues, no one understands what he's saying anyway. By the way, the tongues the Bible speaks of here were known languages on the earth. But then, Verse number four says, He speaketh in an unknown tongue. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. He may personally get some kind of enjoyment out of it, but no one else will who doesn't understand the language. What they had at Corinth 
were natural languages, unknown to some, particularly the unlearned as specified in verses 23 and 24. So verse 4 says, But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So the preaching of God's word edifies the church. Again, it's not speaking in some unknown tongue. It's not some unintelligible language. It's not the raising of hands above someone's head. When people do that, by the way, they're exhibiting some kind of carnal emotion or feeling. But the Spirit of God doesn't work through feelings. In fact, the Spirit of God works regardless of how anyone feels. The Spirit of God doesn't come through feelings, but the Spirit of God comes from the preaching of God's Word. So now here, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 7, And even things without life give sound, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And the truth is, many of the preachers today are not giving a clear sound. In fact, the message of salvation is usually missing from their sermons. But rather, worldly philosophies usually make up most of what is being passed off today as preaching. But preaching is to give a very distinct message. And also, while we're on it, the Spirit of God didn't come upon these dry bones because of the music that was played. All Ezekiel started doing was preaching the Word of God. We do need to have Spirit-filled music in our churches, and thank God for it. But the Spirit of God comes through the preaching of God's Word. In fact, most churches today have music that doesn't give a clear, distinct sound. In fact, most of this so-called contemporary music sounds just like the music of the world. And there's no place for the world's music in God's church. Someone says, but listen to the words. When you take the words of God and when you put them with the music of the world, you're disobeying God's very command when he says, come out from among them. What conquered hath Christ with Belial? It's the preaching of the word of God that brings unity to the singular body, the individual, and his relationship to Jesus. It's the preaching of the Word of God that brings unity amongst believers in the local assembly. And it's the preaching of the Word of God that brings unity to a marriage and a home. But then it's the preaching of the Word of God that brings the Spirit of God and allows the Spirit of God to do His work. But then let me say this, the preaching of God's Word also brings revival. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live. When the preaching of God's word becomes the most important thing, it will bring new life. As Ezekiel preached to those dead bones, those dead bones got up and start living. They started to do something. And when we hear the preaching of God's word, that's when we'll start doing something, doing something for God. People who are alive 
do something by the very nature that they're alive. But a dead person can't do anything. I thank the Lord for those who listen to the preaching of God's word and not just listen, but heed it and do something with it. That's what it's all about. Let me remind us that revival comes, whether it be to an individual, whether it be to a local church, or whether it be to a country. It comes when God's word is preached. Revival will never happen apart from the preaching of the word of God. And of course, the only way lost people can ever get saved is by the preaching of of God's word, because God's word gives the only plan of salvation. But to those of us who are saved, what do we need to, to be spiritually re revived and stay revived? The answer is, we need the preaching of God's word. What makes the difference? It's the preaching of God's word that makes the difference. And so, how are we to avoid being a dead so-called Christian, being a dead saved person. It's all in the preaching of God's word. It's the preaching of God's word that brings unity. It's the preaching of the word of God that brings unity to the singular body, the individual and his relationship to Jesus and God. It's the preaching of the word of God that brings unity amongst believers in the local assembly. It's the preaching of the word of God that brings unity to a marriage and to the home. But then it's the preaching of the word of God that brings the spirit of God or allows the spirit of God to do his work. Then it's the preaching of God's word that brings revival. I'm saying tonight, it's all about the preaching of the Word of God. I can't say enough about the preaching of the Word of God. I love the preaching of God's Word. And I know many of you who are hearing me and, and watching uh, now love the preaching of God's Word. And that's why as the pastor, even concerning our own local church, I tell our people, be in every service of the church hearing the preaching of the Word of God. And since we're live streaming and we can't meet the way we would normally meet, please go back and catch up on all those sermons that you missed. You say, why? Because it's all the preaching of the Word of God and it's the preaching of the Word of God that will make the difference. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I ask tonight, are you saved yet? If you're not saved, what are you waiting for? If you've seen uh, several of these live stream messages from our local church, you heard about being saved. You heard about being born again. You know, that's all the same thing, being converted. Uh, uh, different, different words for the same thing. Are you going to heaven when you die? That's another way to, to put it. We're all sinners. Jesus paid the penalty that we owe. All we have to do is believe on Christ. Put our trust in what he's done for us. Not how good we are, not what church we go to or whether we go to church. Not the new leaf we turned or the good life we're trying to live. It's all in Jesus and only Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then those of us who are saved, may I encourage each and every one of us to make a big thing out of the preaching of the Word of God. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that the Word of God can be preached. How we need the Word of God, how we need to hear it as individuals, as a church, and as a country. God help us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, grind the glory. Revival.